All right, if you'd like to turn with me to Revelation chapter 11, beginning in verse 15, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15 through verse 19 this morning. And my message title is, It All Comes Down to This. It all comes down to this. That's a term we use about um, something coming to its culmination or something that is uh, the most important uh, out of all the details. It all comes down to this, the most important part. Another phrase that we use is, what's the bottom line? The bottom line is, is what's the most meaningful and standing aspect of, of what we're talking about? What's the bottom line? It all comes down to what now? And so, you know, um, for us as people, uh, the bottom line for us, what it really all comes down to is where we are going to spend eternity. You know, we have this life, but uh, once we leave this earth, we will enter eternity. And really, life comes down to where will we spend eternity? Because the soul is eternal, though the body dies on earth, the Bible teaches that our souls are eternal. And so really it all comes down to where are we going to spend eternity? Are we going to spend it with God in heaven or are we going to spend eternity separated from God? And so it's a very important decision. It's a, um, a decision which uh, hopefully um, more and more people will have the opportunity to have the opportunity to consider it because it's important that, that people hear the gospel and have an opportunity to make a choice to spend eternity in heaven. So as we come to Revelation chapter 11 this morning, we are coming to the seventh trumpet and we are coming to the announcement of the beginning of eternity. So we read here in verse 15, it says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So as we come to the seventh trumpet now, um, it is proclaimed there as the seventh trumpet is blown that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. This seventh trumpet really is an anticipatory, uh, uh, an anticipatory announcement is made. We know that um, the tribulation period uh, begins with the opening of seven seals, and chronologically, <clears throat> the tribulation works through the opening of the first six seals, and then uh, coming to the seventh seal. When we come to the seventh seal, then the seven trumpet judgments come out from underneath that. And as I'll demonstrate to you in a moment, at the blowing of the seventh trumpet, there are still actually seven bold judgments that are still future. So the blowing of the seventh trumpet and the announcement that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, the blowing of the seventh trumpet anticipates these things. It announces really that the coming kingdom is at the doors. There are two reasons why I would like to point out to you that this trumpet's announcement uh, is blown in anticipation. Um, the first is that there are still seven bowls left to be poured out. So if you will look in your Bible over in the 15th chapter, just a couple of chapters down the line, you'll read there in chapter 15, verse 1, where John says, And I saw a sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is completed. And then if you just look a chapter further, Revelation chapter 16, it says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, 
go pour out your bowls of wrath of God on the earth. So we have not seen these bold judgments yet. They are still in the future. They follow the blowing of the seventh trumpet. So that is one reason why I give to you that um, what is announced here at the blowing of the seventh trumpet, the kingdoms of our Lord becoming, uh, the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, that it's simply uh, an announcement anticipating what is going to come. The first is, is because the bold judgments have yet to come. The second uh, reason uh, for this is um, that, um, let's see, where am I, where am I at in, in my notes here? <laughs> Excuse me for just a second. Um, the second is that the trumpet judgments are a, uh, the seventh trumpet is actually a woe judgment. So you remember back in chapter 8 that um, as the uh, fourth trumpet had been blown, that the angel came forward and said the remaining three blasts of the trumpets, blast five, six, and seven, would be woe judgments on the earth. And so the seventh trumpet is actually a woe judgment, and um, it is not... Uh, the trumpet announcing the second coming of Christ. Now, some people have thought that perhaps the, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls each happen at the same time. Some have supposed the first seal coincides with the first trumpet, coincides with the first bowl, and so forth and so on. The second seal is broken at the same time the second trumpet is blown, at the same time the third bowl is poured out. Um, but I don't think that that is uh, the, the order. I don't think that, that they happen um, simultaneously, the trumpet, the seal, the bowl, all simultaneously. I think they're sequential. First comes the seals, then comes the trumpets, then comes the bowls. And to demonstrate this, um, when, when uh, the seventh seal is open, the seals come first. Now we're going to compare the seventh seal with the seventh trumpet. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, when he opened the seventh seal, the Bible says there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. You'll remember that from our, our study, uh, that there was a dramatic silence in heaven for about half an hour, and that was at the breaking of the seventh seal. But here in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, when we have the blowing of the seventh trumpet, we read, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So you see, the, the, the seventh seal and the seventh trumpet don't match. The seventh seal, there's silence in heaven. The seventh trumpet, there are loud voices in heaven. And so um, you can see that, that uh, it, there, there's a problem with trying to line up the, the seals on top of the trumpets, on top of the bulls, and making the first one of each judgment happen at the same time. It's better really to understand that the seven seals come first, then out of the seventh seal comes the seven trumpets, and then out of the seventh trumpet comes the seven bowls. So here the seventh angel sounded, and the loud voices in heaven are celebrating, saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. It is so close, and it is at the doors that at the blowing of the seventh trumpet, these things are already being celebrated. And next we read of the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones. They fell on their faces and they worshiped God, saying, we give you thanks, Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come because you have taken your great power and reigned. And then 
They have various things that they, they worship God for there. So we remember that the 24 elders, that they probably represent uh, the redeemed of all time. They represent uh, the redeemed from the Old Testament, uh, 12 from the Old. They re represent the redeemed of the New Testament, that is the church, possibly 12 from the New so these uh, groupings of 12 making 24. Uh, the church is seen here in heaven as well as the Old Testament saints, the 24 elders. At the blowing of the seventh trumpet, they slide off of their thrones, it says here, and they fell on their faces and it says, and they worshiped God saying, you, uh, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty. Before I get to, to talk about what they worship God for, I just want you to notice that in heaven, the, the people there worship the Lord. They're not just, you know, singing praise songs or, you know, sort of reflecting on the Lord, but they're worshiping God. And I hope that you, and I hope that I, as, as worship is presented to us um, at the beginning of our service, I, I pray that we truly are gathered and we worship God as we are being led. It's important uh, in heaven. It, it's meaningful to God. I, I hope that, you know, because we're online, you don't just sort of skip through worship or um, you know, I, I pray that you don't come late to worship, but I pray that you're able to be, you know, present before God as we open our service in prayer, we come before him. And then I pray that as a priority, you worship God as we uh, have that time before the teaching of the word. Because here we see all those who have been redeemed from the earth, uh, the Old Testament saints in the church, when we're in heaven, um, there's no question. It says that they fell on their faces and they worshiped God, saying. And so uh, verses 17 and 18, they're going to, um, they're going to speak of, um, let me see here my notes. I got to double check. They're going to speak of five things that they worship the Lord for. <laughs> they speak of five things. We give you thanks. They're going to thank the Lord for five things. The, the seventh angel is sounded and uh, giving the proclamation that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. It is at the doors. It's already being announced as here. And so they give thanks to the Lord um, and they give him thanks for five things. Number one, it says in verse 17, because you have taken your great power and reigned. Because you have taken your great power and reigned. You know, today we are waiting on the Lord. Amen? We are waiting on the Lord to take his great power and reign. And uh, today in the kingdoms of men, uh, men are reigning at various levels. And, and we've been placed under authority by God and uh, the Bible tells us that we're to, you know, um, that we're to give respect to uh, authority and to obey the laws of the land. And um, but the day is coming when God will delay no longer, but the Lord will take His great power and He will come and He will reign. This is what we saw in Daniel chapter seven. You remember Daniel says, "I was watching in the night visions." And behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. To him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed." So the 24 elders are giving the Lord thanks because the time has come, because God is taking his great power and God is going to reign and the kingdom will be uh, given to Jesus Christ 
and he will rule over that kingdom forever and ever. This will be in fulfillment to the prophecy of Isaiah. In verses uh, 6 and 7 of Isaiah chapter 9, you remember that it says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Isaiah says, And the government will be upon his shoulder. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forevermore. Isaiah says, the zeal of the Lord shall perform this. Amen. When God takes his great power and decides it is time for Jesus Christ to uh, receive the inheritance uh, of the kingdom, uh, God's zeal will perform this. He will take his great power and he will reign. So that's uh, n- number one. Uh, number two, he says, The nations were angry, verse 18, and your wrath has come. The nations were angry, the 24 elders say. They're aware of this. The nations were angry, but your wrath has come. You know, it's interesting today how many rulers are angry at the things of God. You see them on uh, television or online or on your phone, and they're passing legislation with jubilee to um, advance ungodly and um, uh, really, you know, many times disgusting things. They, uh, our politicians are rejoicing as they move those things forward, and then with a scowl and under the condemnation of a hatred, they talk about the things of the Lord. And so, um, you know, the nations are angry. M- many of the politicians are angry at the things of God. And um, so the 24 elders say, you know, the nations were angry, but your wrath has come. And it reminds me so much of Psalm 2, where the Lord asks the question, why do the nations rage? And the people plot a vain thing. You know, it's always a vain thing to rage in anger against the Lord. It's sad that many politicians act that way today. Psalm 2 continues. He says, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together, the House of Representatives, the Senate, against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. But Psalm 2 says, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. That is, he sees them gathered together against him to enact legislation against him. But the Lord, as he sits in heaven, he laughs at their legislation against him and against righteousness The Bible says the Lord shall hold them in derision. Then it gives counsel. It says, now, therefore be wise, O kings, Psalm 2, and be instructed, you judges of the earth. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. So the Lord's like, you know, instead of... um, (laughs) Instead of seeking to enact legislation against the Lord... The father says, rather, you ought to kiss the son. You ought to approach him with acceptance. You ought to approach the Lord with endearment rather than antagonism because um, uh, you will perish in the way when God's wrath is kindled even but a little. So God instructs uh, the, the legislators Uh, the rulers of the earth, because, you know, they hold a very important and powerful position. And and these jobs must be very difficult, no doubt. But God holds our rulers accountable for their decisions. And when they sin against the light of God, they know what God wants. They see it in society. They see wholesomeness. 
godliness, uh, these things. Uh, and when they, when they fight against those things, our California legislator, uh, legislature uh, struck down a bill. The bill was uh, introduced to say that church is essential in these days, and the California legislature struck it down. Um, you know, that is against God. And um, God will hold um, uh, our legislature accountable. And so the Lord, you know, he, 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 he ministers to them. You know, rather approach the son with affection and um, approach the Lord with acceptance and learn to do things his way because uh, as mankind, we are accountable to a holy God and God will sort it out in his time and in his way. In the meantime, you and I have been given uh, privileges by the government. We've been given voting rights, the opportunity to make our, our voice heard. Uh, we should use you know, the opportunities given to us, uh, afforded to us by our, constitu our constitution and, and by our law, but we should stay within those borders um, because the Lord, the Lord is going to handle these things. And uh, we see it here, the blowing of the seventh trumpet, the elders are worshiping God um, because he has taken his great power and he is beginning to reign. The nations, though they were angry, God's wrath has come. They could not, they could not throw off the Lord. They are now accountable uh, in the presence of a holy God. And then the third reason why the 24 elders are giving thanks is he says, in the time of the dead that they should be judged. So number one, you've taken your great power and reigned. Number two, the nations were angry, but your wrath has come. Number three, the time of the dead that they should be judged. Now, again, to speak of this section as anticipating the future, we, do, we know that the time of the dead and the judgment of the dead happens... Um, at the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ. Now, at the blowing of the seventh trumpet, the millennial reign has not yet started. And yet, in the celebration of the blowing of the seventh trumpet is something that's going to happen. It's anticipated about what's going to happen a thousand years down the road. And that is the judgment of the dead that they should be judged. There will come a judgment for the dead. Hebrews 9.27 says that it is appointed for man once to die, but after this, the judgment. So it is, it is celebrated uh, that the judgment of the dead has come. And uh, then the fourth reason is that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great. So the fourth reason for giving God thanks here is that the time has come that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, those who fear your name, small and great. Now, by the way, the rewarding of uh, God's servants has already taken place. We remember that as we're first introduced to the 24 elders, which represent uh, the redeemed of the Old Testament and the church, that the, the, we are seen there seated upon thrones, clothed in white robes, crowns of gold upon our head. It would seem that the rewards have already been given out. And I do believe, it's my personal opinion, the Bible doesn't teach this directly, but it is... is um, it is my thought that we will probably be raptured to the Bema seat of Christ where we will be rewarded because we're going to be, you know, we're going to be glorified. We're going to go from our earthly state to our heavenly state. We're going to be transformed and glorified. And I believe that the, the first stop will be uh, the judgment seat of Christ where uh, not judged for sin, our sin was judged on the cross but where we will be judged for our faithfulness to God and then we will be rewarded accordingly. And then following that will be the marriage supper of the Lamb, which we'll, we will celebrate for our seven years in heaven uh, while the tribulation period is going on down here on earth. So 
The 24 elders, we give you thanks that the time has come that you should reward your servants, he says, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, small and great. The Bible says that we will receive rewards for our service to the Lord. And church, I want to encourage you guys that you would be um, actively serving God. Not because the church has a need, but because the day will come when you will stand before God and you will either be rewarded or not. You'll either be rewarded a little because you served God a little, or you will be rewarded much because you served God much. And as a pastor that God has given oversight to the flock of God, I want to encourage you to be about the business of our Lord because you will or you will not receive a reward based on how uh, you lived this life and, and whether you served God or not. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, listen to this closely. It says, each one, that's, I mean, it's, it's breaking it down to person by person here as it relates to rewards. Each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. So I personally am going to receive my own reward according to my own labor. It, my life will not be related to anybody else's life. Uh, you know, it won't be related to my wife's life or my children's life. When I receive my reward, I will receive my reward according to my own personal labor. And so this is a, a great motivation for serving the Lord. The Bible makes us aware of this, that you might have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. Jesus said, whoever gives you a cup of cold water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, Jesus said, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. I mean, in Jesus' name, you give a servant of God a cup of cold water. Jesus said, you will not lose that reward. No matter what happens, you will not lose that reward. That's an, an amazing statement. So Paul encourages us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, saying, My beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Jesus said in Revelation twenty two twelve, 12, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. So the Lord knows exactly how much you have done in your service to him. It doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you're going to heaven. It has everything to do with how you have lived since becoming a Christian. And it has everything to do with your service uh, for Jesus and for the cause of Christ. And Jesus says that as he comes quickly, his reward is with him. You know, so when the Lord comes in the rapture and he descends from heaven with the shout and, and, and the dead in Christ rise first and we who are alive and remain caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, as the Lord comes, his reward is with him. He knows how much to have in his pocket for you. Let me ask you the question, is it little or is it much? It doesn't have anything to do with your desire. Like, gee, I really probably should. It doesn't have anything to do with your desire. It has everything to do with your own labor. And so I really want to encourage faithfulness. I really want to encourage prayer and uh, seeking God to give you counsel and, and to to ask the Lord to lead and to show and to open up and to provide 
And, and I want to encourage you to serve the Lord because he will reward his servants, both the prophets as well as the saints, the, the general believer, those who fear God's name, both small and great. You know, it's like, hey, if, if, if God allows us to remain small or if God allows us to become great, that doesn't matter. Both the small and the great are going to be rewarded. If the small serves him much, they will receive much reward. If the great serves him much, they will receive much reward. It's not the results that we're rewarded for, but it's for our willing heart to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. God says, I am going to reward that. I am not going to allow that to pass by me unnoticed. I am going to reward that. And so be encouraged, church. Uh, these things are being celebrated at the blowing of the seventh trumpet because they are good things. They are good things concerning eternity. So we give you thanks, Lord God Almighty, number one, because you've taken your great power and you have reigned. Number two, the nations were angry, but your wrath has come. Number three, the time of the dead, that they should be judged. Number four, that you should reward your servants, both small and great. And finally, that you should destroy those who destroy the earth. So those who today are messing things up are going to be taken away. And so the 24 elders worship the Lord for these things. Then the last verse is very interesting, verse 19. It says, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. This is interesting. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven. So the, the, uh, the heavenly scene, the temple of God in heaven was opened. And it was opened to such an extent all the way into the holiest of all that the ark of God's covenant was seen in his temple. You know, the earthly temple and tabernacle were made, especially the tabernacle, uh, the Lord said, make it, you know, Moses, make it according to the pattern that I show you. And so the pattern that was given Moses is a, a pattern to the true temple in heaven, the very dwelling place of God. This being opened up, John says, the ark of of the covenant was seen in his temple. Why would that be? Why would we be told that here? Why would we be told about the Ark of the Covenant here at this point? What, what is the significance? The temple of God being opened and the Ark of his covenant being seen in his temple. What's the significance of that? Why is it happening here and now based on what has just been explained to us in the previous verses? Well, I believe, guys, because it all boils down to this. It all comes down to this, the Ark of God's Covenant, the Ark of God's Covenant. You see, the Ark of God's Covenant is the place where the Ten Commandments of God that Moses brought down on Mount Sinai, the, the two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments, were placed inside this golden box, which was called the Ark. God told Moses, put the tablets inside the Ark. That's why, uh, that's part of the reason why, that's the first half of the reason why, the Ark is called the Ark of the the covenant, because it is the ark or it is the box which carries the conditions of God's covenant with the nation of Israel, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are not only a, uh, uh, a law for uh, God's people Israel, but truly 
the Ten Commandments are the standard of God's righteousness to enter into heaven. The, the Ten Commandments contained in the Ark of the Covenant give us the moral standard for mankind's ability to enter into heaven. And the Ten Commandments lay out the absolute perfection of moral character and life before God. The only problem with this is, is that none of us have ever lived up to the Ten Commandments. And yet, that is God's standard. The Bible teaches if you break one of the commandments, you're guilty of all of the commandments, and that the breaking of one commandment is enough to keep you out of heaven. And so interestingly, the Ark of the Covenant appears as the seventh angel blows his trumpet, and it is announced that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and that he should reign forever and ever, and that the time of the dead, that they should be judged based on the Ten Commandments kept in that Ark of the Covenant. But an interesting thing, well, first let me read to you Romans 3, verses 19 and 20, concerning uh, the, the Ten Commandments and our um, and what and how we relate to the Ten Commandments, it says in Revelation 3, 19 and 20, that we know whatever the law says. It says to those who are under the law, and this is the result, that every mouth may be stopped and that all the world might become guilty before God. Let me read it again. That all, uh, that, that, uh, every mouth may be stopped and that all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, will uh, no flesh will be justified in God's sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So this ark of the covenant bears the tablets which cause all the world to become guilty before God and by which all the world will have the knowledge of sin. When the, uh, as we read in verse 18, the time of the dead, that they should be judged, the time of the dead and their judgment will be based on the Ten Commandments. Mankind will be judged based upon uh, those commandments of God, whether they were kept or whether they were broken. But this is only half the story related to the Ark of the Covenant, which John is now seeing in heaven. Because on the top of the Ark of the Covenant was then placed a lid. And on that lid, as the, the lid, you know, the, the commandments are placed inside the Ark of the covenant, then the lid is placed on top of the Ark of the Covenant. A part of the lid was called the mercy seat. The mercy seat. It was a large dish on, on top of the lid that would settle down on the Ark of the Covenant. And the mercy seat was the place where blood would be sprinkled upon uh, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest uh, would slay an animal out at the altar of sacrifice. He would catch the blood of that animal in a bowl. And that animal that was slain was the sin offering. The animal was slain for the sins of the nation. And the blood of that animal was caught in a bowl. Then the high priest would come into the holiest of all, and he would take his finger and he would dip it in the blood and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. And God would accept the animal's blood which was slain to provide atonement for the people as, it's, as the blood would be sprinkled on the mercy seat the lives of the people and the commandments that had been broken related to what was in the Ark of the Covenant 
would be atoned for by the blood that would be placed on top of the Ark of the Covenant on the mercy seat. In other words, it's as it says in James, mercy triumphs over judgment. The blood would be placed on top of the Ten Commandments, which had been broken by the people. Thus, the mercy seat on top of the Ten Commandments, the tablets, mercy triumphing over judgment. But the story doesn't end there. We're told in Hebrews that after Jesus Christ died on the cross, that he, with his own blood, he entered the most holy place, not on earth, but in heaven. Uh, With his own blood, he entered the place where the Ark of the Covenant, the true Ark of the Covenant is in heaven, And there he presented his blood for all, having obtained eternal redemption. You see, guys, it really does all come down to this. Everything anticipated in the blowing of the seventh trumpet and the coming kingdom and the entering into eternity, it all comes down to our relationship to God through what has taken place at the Ark of the Covenant. If we have come to Jesus, if we have come to faith in Jesus, the Bible says that the blood of God's Son cleanses a man from all sin. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, the blood, having been applied to the mercy seat, is then applied to our lives. And it all comes down to this. But if we've not accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, then we don't relate to God based upon the blood on the mercy seat, but we relate to God based on the commandments which are inside the ark. And we will be judged according to God's holy commandments. Have we ever lied? Have we ever stolen? Have we ever uh, committed sexual immorality? These types of things. If we've sinned at all in any way, we shall face judgment for our sin. And you and I know we have sinned many times in many different ways we are sinful people and so it all comes down to this we will either relate to god as eternity begins through what is in the ark the ten commandments or through what is on top of the ark the mercy seat where mercy is triumphed over god's judgment where the blood of jesus christ being shed for all of our sins, makes atonement between us and and God. And Jesus said that if we would believe in him, that we would not come into judgment, but that we have passed from judgment. We're not relating any longer through what's in the Ark of the Covenant, but rather we're relating to God based on what's upon the top of the Ark of the Covenant, God's mercy seat, and the blood of Jesus Christ, which has been shed for us. Jesus said, if we would believe in him, that we, will, uh, we have passed from death into life, and we shall not come into judgment. So make sure that you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, that you have trusted him and asked Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, that you have become a believer A believer relates to God based on the mercy seat, not on the commandments. Make sure that you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and that you are following him because truly it all comes down to this. Father, we do thank you for this passage this morning, for the opportunity, Lord, to study it. Lord, we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ placed upon the mercy seat in heaven. We thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses a man from all sins. 
We thank you, Lord, that mercy triumphs over judgment, that your mercy through sending Jesus Christ, it triumphs over the demands of your holiness and your holy law. God, I pray if there's anyone out there today that has not yet become a believer, I pray that you will draw them to become a believer today and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. We thank you for our opportunity, Lord, to look at these things, to anticipate eternity, which is coming, and, and to determine, Lord, that we're in a good place as we approach eternity, as believers, as those who are serving you, we shall find a reward. And we shall have a place in your kingdom, God. We shall serve you there for all eternity. And we thank you, God, for these things. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's family said, amen. Amen. All right. Well, God bless you guys. Uh, glad that you were able to tune in today. And uh, join us this Tuesday night, 7 p.m., as uh, we're continuing uh, our midweek study and uh, ladies, uh, this upcoming Saturday uh, is your special time uh, as the Women's Fellowship. 1030, Kaylee, Katie Wheeler Library here in Tustin. Uh, this will be uh, your, your special time that the Lord is providing uh, through the ministry here. So God bless you. May he watch over and keep you. May uh, the Lord be giving you opportunities to serve him, a heart to serve him. And, uh, and, and then when the Lord comes, man, we'll be so just fired up because we, we have been walking with him and found serving him at his return. Now, that's not why we'll, we'll be going to heaven, but we'll sure be happy when we're in heaven that we had, <laughs> that we had served him faithfully on earth. Amen. All right. God bless you guys. We'll see you Tuesday evening.